Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Snowed In. How Snow Shapes the Lives of Plants and Animals. Presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Eleanor Eddy. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Eleanor. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Rob. Happy to be here today. Like Rob said, my name's Eleanor, and I'm one of our Canadian expedition leaders. In fact, right now, I am in Winnipeg, Manitoba, getting ready to lead one of the first Northern Lights trips of 2024. Uh, and while I'm currently experiencing winter, perhaps you are as well. I know that there's been some cold snaps happening in a lot of areas around North America lately. Um, Perhaps you even had some confused and unhappy animals near you who weren't experienced with the cold and the snow. So today uh, we're gonna be going through a few topics here. This is of course, first and foremost, a webinar about snow because snow is not neutral white fluff. It's not styrofoam, um, it's not, uh, not show snow. It's actually critical, uh, a critical abiotic factor in many plants and animal lives. So as a basic rule, if you're looking at a plant or an animal and it spends its winter somewhere that there is snow, because some areas, you know, get cold but don't actually get much snow, um, that plant or animal likely has um, requirements for that snow to survive and thrive in those areas. So I'm going to start off by talking about the physical properties of snow and then get into those proper, how those properties impact plant and animal adaptations and survival. And with this, as I go through snow and then some plants and example animals, I will of course also be talking about cold because cold and snow do tend to go hand in hand and often the use of snow is a bit of a reaction for those animals and plants to get away from cold. So we'll be talking about the cold as well as the snow. Okay, so let's talk about those physical properties of snow. Many of you, I'm sure most of us, have seen snow at some point. If you've seen a recently fallen snow, you've probably seen something like, but maybe not exactly like these snowflakes. Uh, snowflakes form when you get extremely cold water droplets, um, making contact with some kind of dust or perhaps pollen particle in the sky, creating the ability for that ice to freeze around in that crystal form. And we always see these six-sided snowflakes because that's the way ice uh, freezes. It's just the chemistry of how ice works. Um, snowflakes, though, don't remain like this for very long at all. These really intricate shapes that we see during a snowfall event really only last perhaps minutes up to a couple of hours. And beyond that point, we start to see a lot of changes happening in the snow. Now, if you live somewhere, perhaps in the mountains with snow, some of those snow changes I'm going to talk about might already be things that you think about if you're going out hiking in the winter, for example, and you have to think about avalanche risk um, or some of those other physical properties, how they impact you in other ways. Because that snow doesn't stay those snowflakes, it does start to change through what we call snow metamorphism. So a metamorphism is just a change and snow can change by a couple of different formats. It can change in what we call temperature gradient metamorphism, which is sometimes called constructive because it adds to the snowflake. We can have destructive or equitemperature metamorphism and we can have melt metamorphism. That last one when snowflakes melt, I felt like that was relatively self-explanatory and I'm not gonna talk about that too much but I am gonna talk about the temperature gradient changes of the snow and the equi temperature, meaning same temperature changes of the snow. Because all of these will affect how the plants and animals get to use that snow afterwards. And it all depends on those physical properties of the snowpack itself. When you get enough snow, you don't just have a little layer of snow. You don't just have something annoying that you have to shovel. You have this amazing thing that exists in the landscape that we call a snowpack. And the snowpack impacts life that lives in it, life that lives on top of it, and life that lives underneath it. 
because of the physical properties of how it works. So it's not just the snowflakes that change, it's how they work as a unit as well. So snow, um, like styrofoam, is an immensely good insulator. It traps a lot of air within the snowpack as those snowflakes fall, and it insulates surrounding areas from cold or from heat before it melts. So when we get a sufficient amount of snowpack, and this usually means around that 15 inch mark. 15 inches of snow is kind of what we call a sufficient snowpack to behave in this way. And these deeper snow pieces start to show what we call a temperature gradient. So if I were to take a thermometer and take readings all the way down through that snowpack, I would see a very predictable distribution of temperatures. At the very bottom of the snowpack, I would see temperatures that are around the freezing mark or perhaps a little bit below freezing if the area that I'm looking and working in has an average annual temperature that's below the freezing point. You have to go pretty far north for that to happen. As you move up through the snowpack, you start to get away from the influences of that ground and into the areas that are more influenced by the temperature of the air. So this means at the top of the snowpack, it might be warm during the day and cold at night, or it might always be cold if it's a really cold snap. Um, but what we're looking at here is this difference in temperature between the bottom of the snowpack and the top, where on average, the bottom of the snowpack is warmer than it is at the top of the snowpack. Um, so when we get these uh, this temperature distribution here. We're going to talk about chemistry for just a second, but very briefly, so bear with me here. Because the snow is trapping all of those pockets of air within it, this is how it insulates really well, those pockets of air are going to have a humidity to them. And because they're surrounded by snow is, and snow is constantly undergoing sublimation into the air and then back onto the crystals again, those those air pockets are actually always going to be at 100% humidity. They're always as full of water vapor as they can be. So at the bottom of the snowpack, where it's warm, that means that each little pocket of air can actually contain a fair bit of water vapor. As you go to the top of the snowpack, those little pockets of air are still at 100% humidity, but the the actual amount of water vapor in them is less because they're colder. They can hold less water vapor in them at, at lower temperatures. That means that the water vapor at the bottom is always trying to equalize those conditions and moving up in the direction of the top of the snowpack. So we see at the bottom of the snowpack changes happening to those um, ice crystals, to those snow crystals, pardon me. So at the very, very bottom of the snowpack, what we see is a loss of snow. So it starts to actually disappear. And you wonder, where does it go? Well, it's going up in the snowpack by this process. Once you get above the ground and you start to have condensation happening, and so water vapor is coming out of those air pockets, it's landing on snowflakes again. And those snowflakes are then growing in size. So we see then at the depth of the snowpack, a loss of snow, and then a, a formation of what we call a depth pore. So this very brittle, loosely arranged crystals that are very easy for, for example, animals to move around. So the mechanical strength of the snowpack, what holds it all together, disappears when these conditions are in place. Now, the flip side of this, you know, while we had constructive metamorphism, so we had things growing, they were being constructed, we can also have destructive metamorphism. So this is the deterioration of the snowpack. So going from that first, um, that first picture there in the top left where you have those beautiful snow crystals, to the loss of shape, to finally end it up in these rounded ice grains. This is a destructive process that can happen very quickly depending what's happening in the larger world around it. So um, it's a loss of that formation and it's a reordering of the water molecules um, to bake everything into this little ice crystal. So in this type of metamorphism, 
air spaces are reduced because those little ice crystals can pack in closer than a snowflake can. And those crystals can actually bond at their points of contact. This type of bonding where you get a whole snowpack that kind of is arranged and stuck together like this, anything that promotes closer contact, like if I'm, for example, scooping up some snow and squishing it together to make a snowball to throw at somebody, I am adding that energy to the system. I am pushing those ice crystals together and I am engaging in destructive metamorphism of that snow. And that way it's gonna hold together um, more easily. We use this, this characteristic of the snowpack when we are doing things like building snow shelters, whether it's us as humans or whether it's animals. So when snow all comes together like this and we have this Equi temperature, so this only happens when everything's all at the same temperature and we have everything acting together. We can get things in uh, the snow, like this is called a snow snake, where because everything has perhaps been blown by wind or compacted, um, those snow crystals have uh, bonded together and allowed the snow to actually sag down while it's all connected like that. But we can also use this, like I said, when we're building human snow shelters. So igloos owe their strength to the same property. Um, when you cut a block for an igloo, you're cutting snow, not ice, and you're cutting snow that's all from a single snow event. So all of that snow is made up of all of those little ice crystals of the same size that have been pushed together by the wind of the blizzard. And you can actually cut into it just like you can into a into styrofoam and pick it up and all stays together in the block. So the mechanical strength there is quite uh, is quite amazing when you think that it's really just no crystals that have all been jammed together. We can build shelters for ourselves by shoveling snow into a pile and then hollowing it out. And I'll talk in a minute about some animals that do this too, but it's using that same process of destructive metamorphism. So when you take a bunch of snow and you push it together, it's going to become a stronger unit. And in this case, um, with this snow shelter here, we actually took it and we shoveled snow on top of each other. So you're getting um, an acceleration of that process because you've added energy to the system, making those snow bonds stronger. Now, we're using this for shelters, and we'll talk about animal shelters in a second as well, but think about the additional implications here. We use the same principle of destructive metamorphism when we do things like groom ski trails or snowshoe trails, but it's also the same principle that comes into play when, for example, deer will make trails through the snow. We often use as humans the terminology is like, oh yeah, I went out and I packed down the snow. And yeah, when you pack it down, yes, you're compacting it a bit, and that's something where the strength comes from, but primarily the strength of those trails comes from the physical process of those snow grains sintering together and joining when you add that energy to the system. So this is why it's always easier to walk through the snow where somebody has walked before. It's why it's, you know, if you get your car stuck in the snow, um, sometimes you have to pack the snow down and let it sit for a couple of hours and then you can drive it out. It's all that destructive or equi-temperature metamorphism that's making the path physically harder and easier to move on than it would be without that energy being added to the system. Okay, so that was a real quick look at some of the physical properties of snow that have to do with how plants and animals use the snow. So let's get into some examples of how plants survive the winter and getting into that, how they interact with the snow in the winter too. So plants in winter are actually, as you can imagine, a really huge topic, right? We have research that happens on how, you know, crop plants do in the winter, how we can extend the seasons of crop plants to produce a greater yield. We also look at, you know, at garden plants and how we can make frost resistant plants and breed for that. So there's a lot of research that happens on this, but in general, the same challenges always exist to plants, right? If you're going to exist in the cold and the snow, there's a few things that you're gonna have to contend with. 
One of those things is freezing temperatures. And with freezing temperatures, the associated formation of ice within the plant tissues. If you think about frost on your late season garden and losing tomatoes, we know that this can be catastrophic to gardeners as the ice formation within those tissues. If you're a plant in the winter, you might also have to contend with darkness because in most areas, cold temperatures are associated with longer nights. Desiccation is a fancy word for drying. So we know that plants in the winter above the snowpack are exposed to a lot of things like drying winds and low relative humidity air. Below the snowpack, not so much. So that's something that's gonna be very different for the plants that are above and below the snow. And then there's the physicality and the weight of the snow. And the fact that if you're a plant that's living above the snowpack in the winter, you have to deal with the weight of the snow that might be carried on, um, on your body. Now, if we go into these cold areas, we go into these northern or high altitude areas, without a doubt, you know, pretty well everywhere, the growth form that wins are conifers. So these are things like pines and spruce, uh, firs, uh, larches or tamaracks. They, for a number of reasons we'll talk about in a minute, they are kind of the winning species or the winning group of species where cold and snow come into play. And in fact, the, the tree species in the world that grows the most northerly and is able to survive the coldest temperatures, they're both conifers. And like I said, you probably notice this not just in northern areas, but also in areas where you might go into higher altitude places like the tops of mountains that are colder or snowier. We see things like pines and spruces in those areas too, because they again are the winners. So keep in mind though, like as I talk here, I'm talking about plants that grow above the snowpack. And we'll talk in a second about plants that grow under the snow, because they are a different uh, kettle of fish entirely. But why do why do conifers win? Well, part of it is simply their basic shape. So when we talk about how snow shapes the lives of plants, well, you can't get more basic than this. The shape of a conifer is primarily to be able to shed the weight of snow. And when you think about how small they are at the top and how wide they are at the bottom in your typically shaped conifer, and how those branches are able to hold on to the snow and then drop it, and it just keeps sliding down the outside of the tree. Contrast that to uh, if you've ever seen, for example, a an early fall snowfall event on a broadleaf tree. We had this happen a few years back where where I live. We had an uh, it was both an ice storm and a snowstorm, and there were still leaves on the trees. There's a lot of aspen where I live, and in fact so many of the trees bent over and broke and a number of them bent over and never really recovered. They are not designed or able to be able to shed that snow and ice the way conifers can. And they're so, so well shaped for that. Another advantage that conifers have is that they don't, um, with the exception of the larch, they don't lose their needles in the fall like our deciduous trees do. So they are able to generate energy. They're able to photosynthesize relatively early in the spring and later in the fall as well. They're also very physically adaptive. So while I said this is the typical like Christmas tree shape that we see of conifers, if there are um, physical events or physical conditions in the area that don't mean that this is the best shape, you know what? Conifers are just going to grow to be a different shape. So we see in areas like in very high altitude areas or very high latitude areas where perhaps there's, you know, a lot of wind or a lot of ice and this straight up and down shape isn't a good shape. Well, maybe they're going to grow bent over. Maybe they're going to grow with a few branches. Some of the time they actually grow completely prostrate. So growing horizontally across the ground. So they are very well uh, adapted to be able to change based on the local conditions. They're also quite desiccation tolerant, meaning they don't dry very easily. Even though they're sticking up above the snowpack and they don't have access to, to, you know, liquid water all winter, what they do have, they are well able to hold on to. 
So if we look at the inside of a, a needle here, um, we know that within a spruce or a pine needle, there is a lot of water. That's how they, that's how they keep their cells <laughs> um, plumped up and fresh and ready to do things. But they can lose water if they have um, an opening between their cells and the outside world. So where there's that, again, that difference in water vapor pressure, that water vapor is always going to try to equalize those different pressures. So plants are always fighting back against this. And in fact, if you've ever looked really closely at a spruce or a pine or a fir needle, you can see it's got a really thick layer of wax on it. And in this image here, in this cross section, what is stained red is that waxy layer. And we know that in areas that are drier, that have more exposure, that are windier, that wax layer gets even thicker. And whenever you see like a blue spruce, for example, or a spruce that looks in a different color, that usually reflects the fact that it's got a thicker wax layer on its needles. And that's why our eyes perceive the color differently. So that wax is nearly 100% effective at blocking water loss from the inside of the needle to the outside world. Now, just like other plants, they do have little air openings to allow for gas exchange when photosynthesis is taking place, and they're called stomata. And in the winter, those air openings will be completely shut and nothing <laughs> will open them. They are not able to open back up until they have sufficient water in the spring for photosynthesis. So water loss is really not an issue for these trees. However, do they freeze? Absolutely they freeze. If they're sticking up above the snow, they are contending with freezing temperatures. And that ice usually forms around that minus 10 Celsius mark. So that would be around 15 Fahrenheit, give or take. Um, but that ice doesn't happen willy nilly through plant tissue in plants that are adapted to freezing. Your tomatoes are gonna be a different story. But in our freeze adapted plants and our cold hardy plants, they actually start to uh, undergo physiological changes as we get into fall, where they start sending water out of their cells and into their intercellular spaces, meaning that their cells have a higher concentration of solutes. And as that concentration continues to increase, their freezing point drops but ice will start to form in between the cells. That ice formation is encouraged. It's done in a measured um, way. It's not something that happens willy nilly at all. And it only happens outside the cell walls. Um, so to give you an idea of what this can look like in a plant that is freeze tolerant, look at the non-frozen leaf sections on the left and then the frozen leaf sections on the right. And you can see how well ordered that ice formation is. So they're not just good at pushing ice out of their cells and stopping ice formation from happening within their living tissue. They actively encourage ice formation in certain areas where there's room for those ice crystals to grow without causing damage to the plant tissues. And just to give you an idea what we're looking at here, that bottom, one there I think is the most interesting because it's actually next year's bud. That's a bud of a balsam fir. And you, you've got all the, the little layers of um, leaf buds on there. All of those are protected. So they are still living. They are well below the freezing point and ice is formed all around them. But all of those cells and all of those future needles and future branches are just fine. Now, all this being said, these plants, even though they might look green, um, they're not biologically active. All of these plants that are freeze adapted, that will push water out of, out of their cells and start that ice formation, and they've closed up all stomata and all things against the outside environment. What this means is they basically into the, go into the suspended state through the winter. They are not able to be really biologically active through those winter months. But now let's take a look at what's happening below the snowpack at those plants that live under or within the snow. So something that I think is really cool is that there has been um, records of chlorophyll synthesis, meaning the, the growth of the, the chlorophyll molecules, the things that actually absorb the sunlight 
under 80 centimeters of snow. So that would be is that two and a half feet, roughly. And while those plants are under the snow, they're still respiring. We know that under about a foot and a half of snow, plants can have what we call break even photosynthesis. So they are able to capture enough sunlight to make enough sugar and oxygen to then respire and use up that oxygen and sugar to produce CO2. So they're like taking care of themselves even under a foot and a half of snow. They are still biologically active. Um, and here I'm saying evergreen plants, meaning plants that don't lose their, their leaves in the winter. Now, I said that one of the, the conditions here in the winter that plants have to contend with is water loss. What are these plants doing? Because we're still talking about temperatures that are below the freezing point. We don't have liquid water. How are these plants still able to get water out? Well, again, because they're living within the snowpack, remember I said that all those air spaces have 100% relative humidity even though that's not a lot of free water like that water may condense or sublimate onto the surfaces of those leaves it might not be a lot but for the amount of biological activity that these plants are having it turns out to be enough if you're a plant living under the snowpack who is biologically active whether you're a moss a lichen a vascular plant you're getting enough water to have this lower level of activity now this plant that this person's holding on to here, it's a plant called Labrador tea. Um, and it's a really neat plant. It's really well adapted for or against water loss. You can see the bottom of these leaves here are very fuzzy. It's almost like a little felt. That felt helps the plant to reduce water loss in the summer because it slows wind down and doesn't allow as much water loss from those, those areas that air exchange is taking place. This is one of the plants that will continue photosynthesis in the winter, even though sometimes it doesn't really look like it. So this picture here is Labrador tea in the winter when we dug some of it out here. Um, it's often found all the way under the snowpack, but some of it might stick out a little bit. And this plant is showing us a characteristic of plants that I, I love the name of this. It's called thermonasty. So it's movement related to the temperature that those plants are in. Um, and even though it looks like this plant is all dead, all that's happened is that in response to lowered temperatures, it has drooped its leaves and curled them up to help reduce the surface area so that less water loss can happen. It's still able to photosynthesize. It's still able to collect water in that low level from those, um, from those air pockets that are full of vapor. And through this, again, it is, even though it may not grow new leaves, it's still biologically active. It's still collecting CO2 and energy from the sun and producing uh, sugars and oxygen in exchange. So really neat that they're able to do that. This can be taken to um, pretty extreme levels where we can see plants even flowering under the snowpack. This particular plant here is called purple saxifrage. It's one of the the most northerly flowering plants found in the world. And it will flower very, very early in the spring. It's one of the earliest flowering plants out there. And it will usually be flowering well before the air temperatures are above freezing. So even though it may be under the snow and ice, temperatures are below freezing, it's still producing flowers. And if you say to yourself, well, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point of making flowers that insects need to come visit when it's below freezing? Because these plants produce a little almost greenhouse around them, they are collecting that solar energy and warming the area, slowing the wind down. It might be as warm as say 38 degrees Fahrenheit in this clump of saxifrage. Well, it is 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside the clump. So if you're an insect pollinator, this is a really good place for you to be. So even though it seems maladaptive, these plants absolutely know what works for their habitats. Okay, so that's a real fast look at some of the, uh, the plant adaptations to cold and snow 
And I think just knowing how active those plants can be underneath the snowpack lets us just like, I think it's really amazing, but I also have to remind myself to then respect the plants as I'm, everything that you're walking on as you're out there in the winter is still biologically active. It's still living tissue that's there in the winter as well. But let's talk about animals too. Um, I know for, for many people, animals are kind of the, the most interesting thing about this whole thing. And we start learning about animal adaptations pretty early, right? Like I remember my kids coming home with, with cards that they had to arrange into whether they migrated or hibernated or adapted to the winter. And if you live somewhere where there is, you know, seasons, seasonality, so you get colder in the winter, this is something that we're always pretty aware of, right? You're like all of your animal friends or the majority of them leave in the winter, right? Most of those birds, they migrate away. Um, a number of animals will hibernate, so you don't see them through the winter. And the ones that are adapted for those cold winter months are the ones that we're kind of left with seeing, and it turns into a, a much quieter space in the winter. Um, I'm not going to talk about migration or hibernation. I think those are definitely topics all by themselves, but we'll talk about adaptation. And I want to talk about the general kind of look at adaptation and then talk about some specifics. And I should say here that here as I talk about adaptation, I am specifically talking about homeotherms, so animals that do maintain their own internal temperatures, not things like frogs or snakes or insects that are poikilotherms, so they take their temperature from the outside. Excuse me. So when we think about an animal, let's just pick a fox, because foxes are really cute. Um, if you're a fox in the winter, and foxes are winter adapted, they remain active through the winter, you're coming out of summer, and summer was great, and it was warm, and there was lots of food, and there was lots of birds making eggs, and you got to eat a whole bunch, and you got to rest in the sun. Life was pretty good, right? So your energy requirements were both low, because you didn't have to spend a lot of energy to warm up your body, and easy to obtain, because there was lots of food around for you to go out and get. And I should note here how much of our energy we spend on being warm-blooded. When you look, for example, at your own calorie balance, if you're somebody who tracks calories or has looked at that, your calorie requirements are mostly based on the size of your body and how much surface area you have, <laughs> because it's really a measurement of how much energy it takes to warm up the outside of your body to body temperature. So when we think about energy, really think about the heat that is required and how much energy has to go in to making heat. Because when we're looking at our winter energy balance, um, we can come at this heat uh, requirement in a couple of different ways. And usually this is going to be some combination of both these things. You can either, if you're that little fox, you can decrease your energy requirements. And this will probably mean reducing how much heat you have, how much energy you have to burn to stay the same temperature. Uh, if you're a human, that might mean putting on a coat. If you're a fox, that might mean making more fur so you stay more insulated. Or it can also mean increasing your energy output. So burning more calories, burning more energy to produce more heat. So taking a look at this first one here, when we're looking at decreasing how much energy an animal has to use to be the same amount of warm. Um, okay, I said I was talking about homeotherms, but I couldn't pass up these ladybugs. The first thing that we see animals doing is something called social aggregation. And this is particularly noticeable in animals that live alone through the summer, but come to the fall and winter months will come together and they may go into a den together, they may be like these ladybugs and just form a mass. They will aggregate socially, come together, so that as a whole, their surface area is smaller, and therefore they are burning less energy as a unit than they would be burning individually. Another thing that we see animals doing is something called food stockpiling or food hoarding. And this comes up because this. You think, how does this decrease energy requirements? Well, because food in the winter is a lot harder to get to. 
So if you can go out and get a lot of food in the summer and store it for the winter, you will spend less energy going for that food in those winter months. And for example, this is in a, uh, these are twigs in the water. This doesn't look like food stockpiling, but it is beaver food stockpiling. They will collect fresh branches like this and store them in the water for their use in the winter. Another adaptation we see is the increase of insulation. And this might be an addition of white fat, or it might be an addition or a, an increased density of fur. Um, so this can take two different forms. This here is our, our lovely fox that we were kind of talking about. This is an Arctic fox. You can see its summer coat on the left-hand side is quite a bit thinner, less dense than its winter coat, which is longer and thicker. Um, across the board. So that's an example of a change of how this animal can decrease its, its energy and its heating requirements. We can also see something called piloerection. And I happen to have a bird at home, a little pet bird. So I see this pretty often in him, but you can also see it in other animals, including, including like this can happen with both with fur or feathers. So it could be your dogs or your cats. They will kind of fluff themselves up. And so this piloerection is when they're using the muscles just underneath the skin to pull the skin taut and make the fur or feathers stand up more. In humans, we call it getting goosebumps. So that's those muscles pulling tight and allowing the hair to stand up. That would increase the insulative quality of that fur pelt or the layer of feathers. And like in this little uh, tree sparrow here, you can see him all fluffed up. It's going to be um, holding more air that way than he would if he was all, all lean and, and smoothed down. We also see in some animals nest building, and this next nest I hope you forgive me for. It's not my picture. It's really cute, but it's a mouse nest. Um, most of the time we're, we're not too, <laughs> we don't think too fondly of mouse nests, but they will nest up in the winter and um, this comes along with social aggregation in a lot of cases, but in nest building, they're adding insulation, not as part of their body, but as external things like it might be dropped fur or it might be leaves or grass, for example, it might be wood chips, um, might be insulation from your attic if it's a mouse nest and thereby creating that little warm pocket of air for themselves. There's another way to decrease energy requirements as well that's really dependent on the species that we're talking about, and it's a reduction of blood flow to the appendages. And it's not necessarily a reduction of blood flow so much as it, as it is a reduction of the, the heat in the blood that goes out to the appendages. And this is very uh, temperature reliant. So this happens in a, a lot of different animals that exist through the winter. Um, they don't use this feature in the summer when it's not needed, but they will use it in the winter when it is. And it's essentially what's called a countercurrent heat exchange, where blood leaving the body core, which is all nice and warm coming from the body core, will go out towards the appendages, for example, a paw. And as it goes out, it's going through a network of veins that wrap around that artery. And those veins are coming back from that very same appendage. So as the blood's going out, it's already being cooled. And as the blood's coming back into the body, it's wrapped around and it is warming back up so that you can maintain a different temperature at the end of the appendages or at the, at the foot pads, for example, as you can in the body core. Because as you probably know, the amount of heat that's lost comes from a, a number of different ways, but the cooler you can keep that layer of, of air around you, the less heat is going to be lost. So those are ways that we can decrease energy requirements, but we can also increase the amount of energy that's burnt to stay warm as well. And we can increase that energy output through accumulating fat and then burning that fat and by shivering. And if you want the fancy terms for these two things, they're called non-shivering thermogenesis, so ways to make heat without shivering, and shivering thermogenesis, so ways to make heat by shivering. And really when it comes down to it, these are the only two ways that we can really add heat to our to the bodies of a homeotherm. 
that metabolism is pretty interesting. Um, sadly, for a lot of us, <laughs> um, non-shivering thermogenesis, that burning of fat to produce heat, doesn't happen with white fat. So the, the, the fat layers that most of us have on our various parts of our body, um, it's stored energy, but in most cases, it's not burned for heat in the fat cells. Uh, it might be metabolized for energy later if you're, for example, fasting, but it's not really burned to generate heat so much. You want brown fat to generate heat. Brown fat deposits happen in certain areas of the body, and they're very, they're very much found in young and infant uh, placental mammals. But we have not so much of it as adults. There's still some, though, and those brown fat cells have a high level of mitochondria and therefore consume a lot of oxygen and, and energy and produce a lot of heat. Um, they're highly vascularized and they have nerve cells. So that heat then goes out through, through the uh, vascular tissue and disseminated to the rest of the body. And just to give you an idea, brown fat is so efficient at making heat that when temperature probe measurements have been taken, um, underneath the skin of study animals, temperatures are higher under the skin, but above the brown fat than inside the body core. So that brown fat is so, so good at making heat that it's actually hotter than the rest of the body. Now, shivering is, in most cases, the main way of generating heat. And if you're a bird or a pig, this is, in fact, your only way to make heat because uh, brown fat doesn't happen in those groups of animals. Um, I'm going to take humans as an example here because I think we can all understand being cold as a human. We have, like any animal does, what's called the thermoneutral zone. And the thermoneutral zone is the range of temperatures where the body can maintain its core temperature just by regulating the amount of heat that goes to, to your skin. Um, so at the lower critical temperature, you're gonna start to shiver and warm up. And as you shiver at that lower critical temperature, your metabolic rate is going to increase. You're gonna have to burn more calories to stay warm. At the upper zone, your, your, um, your metabolic rate increases as well. And it's usually through acts like sweating and other, other things like that that our body cools us down. Now, just to give you an example of humans, you can see there are example temperatures that we can be thermal neutral range from around 25 Celsius to about 35 Celsius. It's a very small zone. And these temperatures may be different for different animals in different seasons, because remember I said we have all those other adaptations that come into play as well. So the red fox, their lower critical temperature in the summer is eight degrees Celsius. If it goes below eight, they'll start to shiver or have to do other things. In the winter, their lower critical temperature is negative 13 Celsius because they've had a number of those other adaptations come in as well. Now let's talk about some specific examples of animals that show a number of these characteristics. And I wanted to start by talking about the deer family because there's a lot to talk about here. There's a number of cervids um, and I picked, not quite randomly, but I picked the caribou, the moose and the white-tailed deer because they kind of follow a north-south gradient in terms of where they're where they live and also because at first glance there doesn't seem to be a heck of a lot different between them right they might be slightly different sizes but their fur more or less looks the same um their body shape more or less looks the same they're very superficially similar but they do have very physically different ways of dealing with cold and snow and the caribou really is the best adapted to the cold and the snow. All parts of their body are covered in fur, so they have that extra insulation, both on the muzzle, their lips, inside their ears. They have a countercurrent heat exchange to, to their legs. In fact, their feet may be 30 degrees Celsius different than their body core. Um, their lower critical temperature is around negative 40 degrees, so that's both Fahrenheit and Celsius, but individuals have shown lower critical temperatures of down to negative 55 Celsius, so around negative 70 Fahrenheit. Um, they're very well insulated by these long, hollow guard hairs. Um, and one of the things um, 
that they that seems almost backwards is that they're really good at lounging. Um, they will not. They don't have to move around. They don't have to use those muscles to generate extra heat. So they will, in fact, conserve heat by not moving too much in the winter. And what I think is really neat is that between their their amazing insulation, between um, having some supplemental fats, between their lowered metabolic rates because they're lounging so much, they actually use less than half of their summer energy. So they are much more metabolically efficient in the winter as they are in the summer. Um, and if you're wondering why, even though they have to dig for their food, for example, to get their, their preferred food, the lichens, through the snow, um, mostly it's because of the fact that in the summer they're also contending with biting insects, and that's a major metabolic drain on them. So just to show you what their foot looks like as well, um, they have an amazingly low foot load, meaning that the weight or the, the density the grams per centimeter squared, <laughs> the amount of weight per centimeter on their feet is the lowest of any of the servants. So to compare, these numbers won't necessarily mean much to you, but it's about 200 grams per square centimeter for the caribou compared to around 650 grams per cubic uh, per square centimeter for the moose. And the deer is about middle in there. And here is an example of their counter current heat exchange and how efficient it is. So their parts of the body will be at different temperatures. Um, further out will be colder and they'll be maintained at those cold levels. So if you ever hold a caribou's hand and you think to yourself, this poor caribou is so cold, their feet are meant to be cold. That is one of their adaptations to that cold winter weather. So with the caribou, really one of their main ad adaptations that we see to that snow is the low foot loading, meaning that they are able to walk on the snow similar to how, you know, you might go on a set of snowshoes. If you look at the moose here, the moose has to get through the snow in a very different way. Um, they otherwise have a lot of similar adaptations. Their fur is not quite everywhere, but it's, it is pretty good but they're big and they're heavy and their foot loading is extreme. So they're gonna go through the snow. Um, they're not floaters, they are sinkers. Um, so while there are obvious limits to this, and if you look around online, you can see examples of moose who are stuck in deep snow. Um, their bodies are actually built so that they're able to pick their legs up all the way to shoulder level, um, unlike the caribou and unlike any of the other cervids, they have that that extreme mobility in their shoulder joints. Now their lower critical temperature is around minus 40 Celsius as well, so they're also really well adapted to that those cold winter temperatures. Well, let me tell you who's not really well adapted to the winter and you're gonna think, what's going on here? Well, white-tailed deer, um, you might notice if you live somewhere with deer that they tend to spend a, a lot of time together in the winter. We call these deer yards. Uh, these are sheltered locations where a lot of deer will come and pack down the snow. And this is because deer, both white-tailed and mule deer, they're only really able to walk in snow to about 15 centimeters or about six inches deep. They will struggle beyond that point and they use a tremendous amount of energy moving through the snow if it's deeper than that. And this is why you're going to see deer only really moving on established deer trails and why in conditions of extremely thick snow, you're gonna see them moving into these deer yards. Their lower critical temperature is not that low. It's around five Celsius or around 40 Fahrenheit. So white-tailed deer really are living at the, extre the extreme end of their range in these snowy zones. And we see a lot of winter kill of white-tailed deer because it doesn't work out well for every single, every single white-tailed deer, unfortunately. Let's take a look at an animal though, who lives needing the snow. So this one here is the Richardson's collared lemming. And I wanted to bring in both this lemming as well as a bird I'll talk about in a second, as animals for whom snow isn't something that they have to deal with, that they have to adapt around. It's something for whom snow is essential and that these animals would not be able to survive and would likely go extinct without adequate snowpack. So this is the Richardson's collared lemming. Like I said, it's endemic to Northern Canada. They actually will turn white in the winter, which is very unusual for, for small rodents like this. 
Um, even though winter temperatures are usually pretty challenging for mammals, these guys survive and thrive. They will actually gain weight. They may even have an extra litter uh, in the winter, and they will spend the winter in that depth layer that we talked about where the snow gets really light and fluffy. So this characteristic of the snow to undergo that constructive metamorphosis and lose density from those lower layers is absolutely critical to burrowing animals like the lemming. And each of these lemmings, they live, uh, they live singly unless it's a family group. They'll have several burrows. They actually grow uh, thickened pads on their, uh, on their toes to be able to tunnel through the snow. Um, and they will continue to be active and feed and seek out food and sleep and you know, do all of their normal activities underneath the snowpack. And it's very, very rare to see one of these animals under the, like above the snow because all that they will do all summer is remain in that sub-Nivian space. And they're not always much to look at, these snow um, burrows. I like the ones on the bottom in particular to demonstrate what those, those snow burrows look like. And you can really see the size of those snow crystals and how much more easily a lemming is able to move through those than they can, um, for example, more thickly packed snow. So this, this kind of typical layering of the snowpack is critical for these burrowing animals. And when we see things like late season freezes and thaws or um, things like freezing rain coming in the fall, this could have an absolutely decimating effect on the population if they can't make these burrows. A quick example of a, of a small mammal that does not use a burrow um, is the red squirrel. Love these guys, my dog loves them too. Very territorial, loud food cachers. Just wanted to mention these because of the way they use snow to cache their food, because they will remain active all winter and maintain an incredible energy output. Um, their lower critical temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, or it's around 65 or 68 Fahrenheit. They are shivering all the winter to maintain their body core temperature, which means that they need as much insulation as they can, can to build nests. And they will also cache an enormous amount of food. So this here is a, is a squirrel nest in a, a spruce tree. It's a, found some bison fur to make its nest. Um, but the food caching is really what gets squirrels going. A squirrel living in the northern end of its range, one of these red squirrels, they will be surviving primarily on spruce cones. And each squirrel will need something like 15,000 cones to get through the winter. And that food caching is primarily happening within the snowpack and within the top levels of the, of the duff of the forest floor. And the snow is really quite critical for maintaining those cones in good condition for those squirrels to be able to feed on them through the winter. Another really active species in the winter is the Canada jay. Um, I mentioned these to kind of contrast the last species that I'll talk about right away, which is the, the ptarmigan. So the Canada jay is one of the very few birds that remain active in the winter, kind of right at the tree line, right in the northern forest area. And when we think about birds, there are real limits to how much a bird can add insulation, can add fat or can add feathers, because they still have to be able to fly, right? You can't add a whole bunch of fat and still be able to fly around. Uh, the forest. So the Canada jay kind of represents the end of that limit. Um, they will shiver anything below around 30 degrees Celsius and they again have to maintain the amount of food caches to keep that shivering up. It's kind of crazy how much they have to work. So all the birds that you're seeing out in the winter, um, they might be fluffed up, they might be showing that pilo erection, but know that all of these birds, unless they are flying, and this includes even big birds like the raven, unless they're flying, they are actively shivering 100% of the time to maintain that body core temperature. However, let's contrast that, like I said, with our, our last species here, which is our willow ptarmigan, because this um, shows you how snow can be used in ways even by birds. 
So if you've never seen a ptarmigan, they're kind of like grouse. They're ground dwelling birds. They're kind of round and they can fly, but they don't tend to fly very far. So because they are like really non-flying birds, all their food is on the ground, they are able to add insulation and their feather layers will actually double in the winter. Each feather quill will actually have a second rachis coming off of it, effectively doubling their insulation. They even get feathers on their feet. And on top of that, being able to better insulate themselves, they will use the properties of destructive metamorphism to tunnel out um, a den for themselves, a roost, underneath the snow. And underneath the snow, they'll maintain a couple of these around, but they will spend three times less energy keeping warm underneath the snow than they do above the snow. And they will spend up to around 22 hours per day within these snowpacks. So really with all this, um, I hope you've kind of seen the differences that we see with plants and animals that live above versus below the snow and how much that snow really impacts both the way these plants and animals work and the very shape of them. So I know I've taken it right to the last minute, but I'm going to hand it back over to Rob for questions. All right. Thank you so much. Now, before we get into the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in the control panel. All right, let's get to some of these questions. Uh, so is the biologically inactive time of a frozen plant similar to torpor in birds? Okay, is the biologically active time of a plant similar to torpor in birds? And I'll extend this to maybe torpor in mammals as well. So with birds, as well as mammals, torpor is the this, this state of suppressed metabolism. So they, they will drop their temperature to being something above ambient temperature, um, but very much um, lower than their normal body core temperature will be. With, and that's done in a very staged way. Torpor is always temporary, it's interrupted, and they wake back up, uh, in the case of mammals, by Brown fat actually triggers this um, temperature increase again in these mammals. In birds, it's triggered through other things besides brown fat because they don't have it. Um, but torpor is generally considered something that animals will go into and out of. So for example, a hibernating squirrel, like the, like the Arctic ground squirrel, um, I'm speaking to that because I don't I don't have an example to hand for birds and how much they'll come out of it. But torpor is is always like interrupted at times. It might even be for it, the same is the case for bears. So in a squirrel, it's a very fast thing. So every couple of weeks, they'll wake back up, they'll expel waste products, they'll roll over, take care of themselves, and go back into torpor. And birds that can decrease their temperature will do something similarly as well. With plants, they're really um, decreasing their internal temperature down to the ambient level, and they won't go through those wake-up cycles midwinter like the animals can and will. Plants are plants do not generate their own heat for the most part. They make a little bit through respiration, but they are truly dependent on ambient temperature for generating the majority of their heat. They don't have resources, fat resources to burn like the way um, animals do. For the most part, there's always exceptions to everything. So just how can plants photosynthesize under the snow if they're not exposed to the sun? Ah, great question. So like I said, plant photosynthesis can take place up to around, I say like four and a half feet into the snow. Um, there's been studies looking at the amount of light that gets through the snowpack. And if you've ever had the occasion of um, being in the snow and perhaps digging out a like a snow shelter for yourself, you'll know this, that even though you might have, you know, snow walls that are a foot thick, there's still ambient light that gets through. And up to around that four and a half to five feet of, let's say fairly not compacted snow, like normal snow that hasn't melted and refrozen, you will have, it might be around, you know, 0.1% of light, or it might be 1% of light coming through, but there is light transmission up to about that point in the snowpack. The light that's transmitted is refracted and scattered by the snow molecules. So the light that gets through is really 
blue tinge, which is why if you ever look at ice or snow, it tends to have that blue color to it. It's the refraction coming from the snow, melt, uh, the snow particles. And that blue color is actually really, really uh, what those plants want anyway. So even though it's a low proportion of light, the light that comes through is their preferred color and it is enough for those low levels of photosynthesis to take place. Well, great, thank you for explaining that to us. Um, so when the snow does melt on the top layer, does some of that moisture, is it able to seep into the ground through air pockets to provide water for the underground plants or the buried plants? Uh, I guess this question has two parts, right? If you get a, a like a midwinter melt, for example, and you have a bit of liquid water where there's still a lot of freezing happening. Generally, um, when plants are maintaining their body or their body, like let's call it their body temp. When plants are maintaining their temperatures below the freezing level, um, they have those ice particles within those intercellular spaces. So if you have some amount of liquid water that is able to enter the plant, but ambient temperatures are still really low, that water is simply going to go and join that ice that's already built up. It's not going to go into the cells. What the plant's trying to avoid is ice formation within the cells themselves. And it's a much higher preference for the plant that has to live through the winter to be inactive and, and to be like a, a squished up little cell that has very little water in it and have ice outside the cell than it would be to have ice crystals forming within the cell. Because when ice crystals form in the cell, they're crystals. They rip right through cell membranes and they cause cell death and they cause things like um, even without cell death, they can lead to proteins being de denatured and things like that. So a plant close to the freezing temperature, if you have a brief melt or something like that, they are not going to be like actively working to kind of wake back up yet. They're going to uh, wait until we have consistent warm temperatures. So it's not going to be dangerous to make that process go the other way and start to bring water back into the plant cells. In the spring, that's exactly what happens when, when melting is happening through a snowpack, like it sometimes looks like it's happening right at the top. And you know sometimes it is, but it's happening all the way through the snowpack. And we start to see that deformation of the snowpack and we see water running out of it. And you know you might be walking out in your rubber boots and you step and you feel that there's water at the bottom while it's still snow on top. That water, if it makes contact with a plant's absorbed tissues, will absolutely be absorbed by a plant. In a lot of cases, that melting starts happening when the ground is still frozen. So there's a not as much of that water enters into the soil as you might think. A lot of it will just run down over frozen ground and join the local creek or lake or what have you. So do we know why that guard hairs are hollow? Is there a genetic advantage to that? There's absolutely advantages to, to having hollow hairs and this can be extreme in some animals. So if you've ever looked at an animal pelt, maybe even your dog, there tends to be two layers of hair. There's the the guard hairs that sit on top, they're usually coarser, and then the under fur, which is often uh, softer. The under fur is quite insulative and it's warmer. And the, the purpose of the guard hair is twofold. It is to add insulation, but it's also to be waterproof. So the guard hair is being hollow means two things. Um, because they are thicker, and often they might be a little bit um, oily because of the oils produced by the animal. Water will tend to run off of it. And if you've, ever, if you've ever like hosed your dog down, for example, you know, it takes a bit of spraying until you start to get water going into the under fur. The hollowness simply adds insulation. Um, heat can escape through a number of ways. And one of the ways that heat escapes is by conduction. So energy moving through one thing to another, right? If I touch um, if I touch the table that my computer's on, energy, heat energy is leaving my hand and going into the table. I will have more heat energy leaving my hand touching this glass table than I would if I was touching a cold styrofoam block because the amount of uh, conduction that can happen through that styrofoam block is less than it is through this glass table. 
and each element and each uh, each thing will have a different amount of conductive property. Air um, has very low conductive properties, which is why when you wear your down jacket, it's not so much the down in your jacket that's keeping you warm. It's the fact that it can trap a lot of air and that air has very low conduction. Therefore, you will stay warmer and more of your body heat stays inside your jackets. Same concept with those hairs being hollow because heat is less able to move through air. More of that heat will be trapped by the fur than can leave the fur. Well, great, Eleanor. Thank you for that explanation. Unfortunately, that will be the last question that we do have time for. So I'd like to hand it back to you for some closing comments. All right, well, thanks everybody for, um, for showing up today and learning hopefully a bit around snow and how animals and plants are adapted to cold and snow. I hope that if you had a cold snap where you are, that you had the chance to get outside and experience the cold and hopefully enjoy the cold as well. And I hope the same cases if you got, got some, some snow to play in as well. It's, uh, you're never too old to go play in the snow. So I hope you get a chance to go outside and experience some cold today. And thanks again for coming by. Eleanor, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.